So, uh, hello everybody, it's a great pleasure to be here and I thank all the students uh, for their kind invitation. The round of talks in the morning was uh, very excellent and uh, I learned a lot of new things this morning. So, uh, thank you again. It's great to be here uh, and uh, so t today I, when I got a call um, from one of the students uh, to give a talk in this event, um, I did not know that uh, the Founders Day included these kinds of uh, talks uh, initially and then uh, she basically said uh, talk a little about your research experiences and what you're doing now and uh, so I thought I'd just divide this into 20 minutes approximately of uh, things uh, that have been most memorable for me during my research experiences mostly for gearing towards this talk is geared towards students and it also includes some snippets from my days at CCMB as well and uh, so for those who were here previously I think it's like going a bit um, um, you know you could recollect some of the faces from the photos that I have and uh, 20 minutes of my talk I'll spend towards what I what I'm doing right now uh, with uh, at DeepSeq and with Exigen Genomics uh, both of which uh, where I work so um, uh, again this is sort of a uh, chronicle of those uh, those things so this is uh, August 2000 my batch uh, when we all joined so there was like a batch of 16 to uh, 18 a few of us left and you might recognize a couple of faces I don't know but uh, this was uh, uh, in 2000 and this was close to when we were finishing up which was in 2005 and um, um, I think uh, Kasturi was here also to give a talk and uh, a few other others uh, some of you might know. So this was uh, um, um, uh, uh, back in 2005 when several of us were actually leaving, uh, leaving CCMB and this was, uh, I graduated from Gansham's lab, I'm happy he's here and so this was a lab around 2003 and uh, with uh, students, a uh, small set of students and a postdoc. So I think the lab is uh, sort of still there. Uh, so this was from 2003, so these are sort of some of the photos that I have of my uh, days uh, from back then. So um, the first thing I uh, sort of always look back with a fond memory from CCMB is uh, is that uh, um, you know uh, we have the dubious distinction of doing uh, of completing PhDs from the same lot of tack. So um, um, at some point uh, during uh, during our uh, PhD days, uh, we uh, we uh, made tack polymerase in the laboratory, and almost three, four, five students in in in, in my batch as well as in the subsequent uh, in my lab uh, uh, completed a lot of our PhDs with PCRs from uh, from TAC. So I don't know where's the pointer here. Maybe this one here, yeah. So as you can see, this is from my CCMB protocols notebook. So I'm not allowed to take my uh, other notebooks back when you leave, but you can take your protocol notebook. And I just fished this out. And this is actually uh, an experiment that we did wherein we purified tag, and this is sort of the tag that we all used, which is the night lane there. So this is sort of a very memorable uh, incident for me, uh, uh, you know, right now. So it doesn't make a lot of sense now, but at that time it, it, made, it made a lot of sense. And uh, so so it's a fond memory of mine from uh, from CCMB, and. Um so I worked in Gansham's lab. I joined Gansham's lab because I was interested in looking at protein phosphorylation. Um, and uh, Gansham's lab at that time was working on protein tyrosine phosphatases and also a hematopoietic cell kinase, which is wh what I started to work on at the at the beginning. And uh, but things didn't quite go the way I wanted. And within eight months, we were at a point where some of the assays weren't working. And so then at that point, Gansham told me that there's one this one experiment that you can you know with the we're working on uh, a phosphatase called PTPS2, and uh, which stabilizes p53 protein in cells, which increases the amount. And so, um, uh, well, and we were looking at this gene called IPAF. So the details don't really matter, but essentially, that uh, he said that if this experiment of yours worked, then you'd probably be able to go on to do an entire PhD with this. So this was sort of the experiment that uh, sort of led to a series of things which actually started out. So this is sort of my first result. 
uh, in the lab, lab which actually led to my PhD. So I spent the next five years uh, basically characterizing how this gene was regulated by P53 and it seems an awful lot of time right now to spend on one gene and the regulation of it but nevertheless that's, that's how it was at that time. And uh, I don't know how many of you would recognize something like this but you know so this is an interesting event for people who might know Ghansham. So this was a very telling moment for me. This was during my early days of my PhD and uh, uh, I wasn't really sure about doing experiments but uh, I was still getting the hang of it. And then we ha I had to do one experiment where we were looking at what is the transcription start site of this gene because uh, you know this, uh, this was a new gene. It was very poorly characterized and uh, we wanted to look at cis elements on this gene. So we wanted to know where the transcription start site was and so I did a primary extension analysis and uh, basically I had to get some bands in this lane shown plus here and surprisingly I got you know those bands were visible and I was very surprised and so was my advisor so much so that he accompanied me to the phosphor imager to make sure that those bands were in place and this was sort of like you know very telling so I, th I thought we were like uh, invested in this whole thing and so I really appreciate him for his uh, uh, you know for his uh, what to say integrity in all this and it left a telling mark. So these are some of the um, uh, some of the things that I took back from my PhD days at CCMB, and uh, it, it, it was a wonderful time. I learned I learned a lot of things and it sort of set my uh, set my career in science. And then um, after leaving CCMB in 2006, I moved to Boston uh, to work in the laboratory of Jim DiCaprio, which uh, largely work on the cell cycle and cell cycle regulation, and also in some aspects of virology. So in the in six years that I spent there, spent most of my time working on this complex called DREAM, uh, which stands for different components that constitute this complex. So again, a lot of this is like relatively old information. I don't want to go into the details of each of this, but leave you with a sense of what I got from some of these, so that it might you know uh, you know it might be relatable to you in some fashion or the other. So uh, we were looking at this complex through the cell cycle, and this complex comes in different flavors meaning it has different partners during quiescence and at different other phases of the cell cycle and it was kind of interesting to study because of all this and at that time all cell cycle target genes were labeled as E2F targets and what we basically tried to show was that there were different flavors to E2F dependent gene expression and there were like different spikes of gene expression through the cell cycle that is some genes are expressed early and some are late and this is for a reason uh, because you don't want mitotic genes to be expressed before. Uh, we didn't know all the, what all the connections were, but most of my work was uh, dealt with this complex. And so what I found uh, very early on in, in, uh, when I moved there in 2006 was that my first experiments there were uh, chip, QP, uh, ch chip PCR experiments and quantitative PCR experiments on the promoters of a bunch of genes. It was around that time that uh, chip on chip or chip and then later on hybridizing onto microarrays started becoming popular. So we were one of the first labs to do such, such kinds of experiments and we were helped by Shirley Liu who developed the MAX and other programs. Uh, she's a biostatistician and uh, uh, who has done a lot of work in allowing uh, researchers to interpret their results uh, bioinformatically. So uh, what I realized was that, well, I could be doing this forever or I could do something like this where I'm assaying hundreds of G or thousands of genes at the same go. And this was sort of a telling moment for me at that time. Now we hear a lot of talk about looking at hundreds or thousands of genes across in one shot in one go. It wasn't so very prevalent then. It was just starting to come up. And this sort of reflected also a change in my mindset because I, what I learned in CCMB was largely to look very carefully at specific things. But what I learned at, uh, in Boston was to look at large number of things and sort of zoom back and look at differences in expression of hundreds or thousands of genes in a single experiment. And so this kind of made a lot of difference. So we did a bunch of things in this. Uh, and so while this was important, it was important to characterize mechanisms, it was also important to look at a larger scale of how things were changing en masse in cells. And so I'd, uh, at this uh, point, I'd like to just highlight one experiment uh, from this, which uh, I, I thought was uh, an interesting way at that time of how we did it. 
So um, this uh, cluster of genes, so this time course here shows cells in different phases of the cell cycle with uh, this arrow pointing to cells in mitosis. Now you can look at this expression, so red means high expression of like uh, several genes and you can see that the ones that are all having very high expression in 6 and 8 hours are the G2M genes, so genes that are expressed uh, right towards uh, transition into mitosis. And these are the early cell cycle cluster genes which are involved in replication which are you know sort of expressed early on during the cell cycle. And what we actually showed was this, this flu, two flavors of this complex that we were studying, that is dream and then the other flavor which is the S phase, they sort of bind differently to both, uh, both these sets of uh, targets. So we were looking, we were uh, comparing chip experiments with expression which at that time was relatively new and uh, we were able to mine a lot of data from this. So at this point what happened, really happened was I got comfortable working with people, with bioinformaticians and biostatistics statisticians and uh, started getting comfortable looking at large data and uh, feeling, uh, having an idea about how these things work and then what to mine from this, what, what kind of information you can mine from this kind of uh, data. Um, so uh, at the end of this exercise, of course, what, what they the things that we proposed in terms of this complex was widely accepted. So uh, one of our reviews appeared on the uh, cover page of uh, uh, Nature Reviews, wherein you know shows this person actually dreaming about the cell cycle. So you know he was not prescient about the cloud or anything. But at that time, cloud computing hadn't begun. It was basically like because the complex was called Dream that they had this cartoon. But I show this here mainly because now I told you the flavor of this complex changes through the cell cycle and at this point one of the proteins here MIB is degraded by proteasome mediated degradation. Now the reason I highlight this is the following. Again this is one of my most memorable um, experiments from my uh, postdoctoral days. So um, um, you know we were interested in identifying what caused the degradation of this protein BMIB. Uh, of course, we didn't. I want. I want to, uh, you know, reveal the surprise first. We never did it. We couldn't find the E3 ligase that was responsible for degradation of BMIB. It is known now, but we couldn't find it. But nevertheless, the reason I I want to point out a series of experiments, which is not published, but again, such results don't get published. So I just want to present it in this forum. So when we uh, we were looking for the E3 ubiquitin ligase for BMIB, these the these show western blots after precipitation of BMIB during the cell cycle. So as you can see here at some point BMIB is getting degraded and then we were looking in a proteomic experiment we found proteins like tocyl like kinase and BPRBP which is a component of an E3 ubiquitin ligase co-precipitating with it. We did a bunch of experiments and this was very exciting because this was a protein that was involved in the cell cycle. It was a substrate recognition complex for an E3 ubiquitin ligase and we were sure that this sort of was the component that that involved that was responsible for degrading BMIP, but uh, uh, then but but we were getting really uncomfortable with how the data proceeded because we were seeing VPRBP even when there were low levels of BMIP. So we were really not confident about it. So we undertook an experiment wherein we knocked down BMIB. So as you can see, this is the input. And then you can see here, this is a non-specific band. This is the band of BMIB. And we have completely removed it in an IP. We don't IP BMIB. But you can see here, we can still IP VPRBP. So this clearly showed that this was an uh, antibody effect. So the antibody non-specifically immunoprecipitated another protein that make perfect biological sense, but uh, did not uh, really add up. It was not a true result, but an artifact. So, um, um, you know, so this sort of ended there, but we went through almost four or five months trying to, in, uh, you know, sort of pro, uh, try to follow up on this observation, but it ended up to be false. So you may be frustrated for a while, I mean, I'm sure most of us encounter these kinds of things, but then at the end, you, it ends up, when you look back at it, really strengthening your uh, scientific temper and then um, your quest for actually finding what is true, uh, rather than uh, try to find out find that it was later an artifact. 
And um, um, uh, the interesting thing about the beam of B3 ubiquitin ligase that I want to mention, the, that the uh, ligase that was responsible for degrading beam was identified, it turned out to be nothing other than, um, it turned out to be VHL. Now, um, perhaps uh, people in the cancer uh, field would know what VHL is. It's involved, uh, it's an important, uh, uh, in important E3 ligase which degrades uh, HIF2 or uh, hypoxia inducible factor. Now, for those, uh, you know, uh, uh, our lab in the Dana Farber were next door to Bill Kalin's lab, who spent their entire, he spent his entire life studying VHL and uh, um, uh, HIF. He won the Nobel Prize a few years back for his work in oxygen sensing. And uh, it turns out that the, the protein that that lab was working on, and we were good friends with the lab, was the one that was responsible for degrading beam, but we never made the connection. Somebody else who made the connection. So it was kind of ironical that, uh, you know, um, that this happened. But nevertheless, it got, it did get identified, just not by us. So I just wanted to share this, uh, that this goes into the book of artifacts and, um, um, you know, never to be heard of again, I guess. This sort of got stuck. Ah, so, um, so then after my uh, postdoctoral work, I uh, wanted to transition to India for several reasons. Um, um, and uh, during that time, uh, I was very interested in looking at the connection between replication and mitosis. So basically, what really, uh, uh, what really got me was uh, uh, how how do cells sense that every uh, bit of DNA is replicated before they begin to know that they have to divide. Now this problem is almost solved right now, but at that time it was an open question. While I didn't get to investigating that, and this was sort of one of the things that, and I'll tell you in a a few other slides that what I really went on to go and do ahead but this was what I what I had thought of doing and uh, it you know if you look back at uh, if I trace back so I, I followed this literature on and I found uh, that uh, recently this problem has been addressed and uh, uh, what was found was ATR and checkpoint kinases help in sensing the end of replication and coupling it to the start of mitosis so it was really uh, uh, you know uh, a telling moment for me because um, well you know, uh, ideas are uh, you know, a lot of people can have ideas. We all we all have our pet theories and ideas, but uh, the, you know, discoveries wait for none. And uh, uh, with the right environment and right kind of uh, people and resources, uh, they do get made and push the science forward. Really. So and uh, so then I, I I first started working uh, in India at and, um, you know when I moved back at uh, Instem or Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine in Bangalore. And at the time I made the shift from uh, working on uh, cell lines to working with uh, human tissues and tissues from patients. This was not a well uh, you know this was not what I had thought I would do, but uh, this was how uh, it turned out for me when I moved back and. But then it was uh, it was a really good turn of events at that time, because uh, what happened really then was that uh, I was sort of mentored by a bunch of uh, pathologists from the Kidwa Institute of Oncology. So uh, um, um, you know I should mention the names here: Rekha Kumar and Geeta Sri Mukherjee, who took a lot of effort in explaining and uh, telling me about the oral epithelium. And this is sort of a slide uh, which tells about the stratified uh, uh, oral uh, epithelium. You can see the basal layer layer of uh, cells and progenitors and the top layer of differentiated cells. And uh, so I learned a lot from them about looking uh, at things with clinical relevance. And I started going, visiting the hospitals often and this got me into a different sort of line of uh, thinking. Um, and, uh, and, and, and at this point, uh, from my previous experiments, I was also interested in looking at things at a, at a scale. I was interested in looking at things um, in, in, um, through genomics or in, uh, where I could look at changes or differences in, uh, in, in several groups of genes rather than focusing on particulars. 
So therefore, I had this opportunity to look at, uh, um, you know, uh, a, a population of cells that were uh, uh, hypothesized to be stem-like cells in, uh, in head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. So these are stained by CD44, which is a membrane marker, which is sort of mutually exclusive with involucrin, which is a, a differentiated cell marker. So these, this sort of bottom layer is stained by CD44 and the top layers are sort of stained by involucrin and this is a, a tumor tissue. So this is a dysplastic epithelium. This is a tumor tissue again where you see this. So we basically from patient samples, we isolated these groups of cells by fax and we did uh, genomics to identify differences in expression um, um, uh, between CD44 positive and negative cells to see if we could find something of relevance here. So I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to go into the results but rather to look in general about things that I've been, um, that I've been looking at. Um, then my, uh, through this journey of looking into uh, you know head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, so HNSCs are head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, uh, I started getting interested in looking at uh, 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 some group of head and neck squamous cell carcinomas which have mutated caspase 8. Now the reason this was interesting was about because about 30 percent of all oral squamous cell carcinomas in, uh, in the Indian population have mutations in caspase 8. The relevance is not known and it's not of very very significant question because there is no staging of these tumors that is done in the in the hospital setting so information about this is not relevant to patient treatment or prognosis so therefore there's limited interest but there's a biological curiosity of uh, how uh, why these group of tumors are different and so what we found by mining the uh, cancer uh, uh, the cancer genome atlas or the TCGA data um, was that we found that uh, this group of tumors had a uh, higher level of immune cell infiltration. So it had higher levels of neutrophils and dendritic cells. And this was also marked by, uh, you know, some, by the time I, you know, I'd gotten comfortable doing a lot of uh, data mining using different genomic tools that are available. So we looked at caspase 8 mutant and wild type tumors using gene set enrichment analyses. And we found that uh, genes that are involved in inflammatory response are highly enriched. So if you get a nice slope like this, it means that it's enriched in one set versus the other. And in this case, it was enriched in caspase 8 mutant head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. So I did this work with uh, Yashoda Ganekar, um, uh, my friend and colleague from uh, INSTEM. And we both left INSTEM to start uh, DeepSeek Bioinformatics, um, a company based in uh, Bangalore, where we provide genomic uh, uh, data services. So to date, we have had uh, uh, clients from several institutions, both academic as well as startups and from the industry as well. And we've looked at a wide range of uh, organisms and data. So the, the, uh, the fulfilling thing about working in something like this, of course, is that uh, we encounter a diversity of topics and uh, the prospect and challenge of learning uh, very new things because you have to encounter uh, while looking at that organism. For example, we've looked at bacteria, viruses, Drosophila, C. elegans, fungi, um, novel viruses, microRNAs, human patient samples, so on and so forth. And the feeling of accomplishment at the end keep us going in this endeavor. We've got a few acknowledgments in papers, one of which is sort of highlighted uh, here, and this is indeed a good feeling. So this is something that uh, I'm involved in, I continue to be involved in. Uh, we offer a wide range of services. And um, so basically through this journey, what I've uh, found is sort of a, a niche in two things that I really enjoy doing. One is uh, looking at uh, sort of using the tools of the genomics toolbox to identify, uh, uh, to identify new features and then uh, things of clinical relevance uh, that I've sort of uh, made a conscious attempt to imbibe in whatever research I do is to do things with a clinical relevance. And so that's when, um, so the next uh, 15 minutes of my talk or so I'm going to spend talking about the science that we're doing at Exigen. So Exigen is based in Hyderabad. It's uh, founded by uh, Dr. Amit Ray, who's a, a neurosurgeon at uh, Apollo hospitals and uh, so we have a bunch of uh, neurologists we have a new neurologist intern who has joined us and uh, we have um, uh, uh, a few scientists and um, um, we have an excellent uh, uh, AI ML team 
which is trying to develop algorithms, where I'll talk about it later. And this is sort of an effort where we've been uh, looking at, we are focused on brain tumors, mainly adult, uh, glioma, uh, adult glial tumors. Uh, from, and uh, right now we have a sort of a repository of, of almost 3,000 uh, tumors from Indian patients, a few of which we have analyzed and we are going to share, I'm going to share some of that information with you here today. And so uh, why, why is it important? Like I told uh, previously, I just hinted that hum uh, you know, in uh, squamous cell carcinomas, in head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, caspase 8 mutation did not have any significance in staging or so on. But that's not the case in several other uh, other cancers. For instance, in brain tumors, staging is very important and identifying the kind of glial tumor is important as well. And I'll talk about this subsequently. Um, and uh, But also in elderly patients especially, differentiating primary and secondary tumors still remains a challenge because it is difficult and there's a lot of inaccurate diagnosis. Almost 30% of a uh, lot of pathological diagnosis in the clinic are, uh, you know, largely there are publications that indicate that they are sort of inaccurate. And this can translate into a difference of almost a decade in prognosis for these patients, really. And so there are a lot of operative complications, especially in brain tumors, with, uh, you know, quite uh, associated with, you know, high levels of mortality and paralysis. And, um, um, uh, and the WHO classification as of now has improved tremendously, but then it's not tailored for use with next generation targeted therapies right now, but we expect that to change subsequently. And so there are two, uh, basically three things that, uh, you know, we have in our product por portfolio, but uh, one of the more ambitious things is, uh, that I'm not going to talk about today, but I'll just briefly hint upon, is, uh, uh, you know, that uh, ideally we would like to take a sample of uh, uh, blood, isolate uh, tumor endovesicles, and then um, uh, use our algorithms to match the signatures obtained from this with whether how much of the tumor signature is reflected in this and then help uh, in the prognosis of the patient. So our product for our portfolio has uh, two tests and one of the, uh, this ones is with data. So this is the liquid biopsy that I previously, I just alluded to previously, which is basically looking at uh, uh, exosomes from blood. The other is the tissue biopsy tests, which help in, stage, uh, in staging of tumors. And this is something that I'm going to talk about in the next few slides and why it is important. And our efforts at uh, developing, uh, you know, uh, machine learning driven algorithms for better accuracy and staging of uh, brain tumors. And then uh, we are also developing a data repository platform uh, for which will have data from our patients in a secure, in a secure manner. Um, so why is this important with respect to the, you know, the second point is what I want to talk about today, which is basically a tissue biopsy, which helps in identification or in uh, classification of the brain tumor. So in uh, the WHO classification of adult type diffuse gliomas right now, so this is the group that we are looking at right now. Okay, so there was a whole lot of heterogeneity in terms of how it was classified previously. But right now, you want to classify adult diffuse gliomas basically into one of these three types. Basically an astrocytoma or an oligotendroglioma, we'll just call them oligos, and glioblastomas. So these, the differentiation is mainly on uh, the uh, presence of a mutation in a gene called IDH1 or IDH2. IDH1 most predominantly. So um, uh, this is sort of a general uh, scheme for classification of gliomas in adults. You can see that, uh, you know, as per, it's written as per histology, so this is based on IHC for the mutation in IDH1. So you either have an IDH wild type or a mutant. If it is a wild type, typically, and you have features of the tumor, of course, then uh, it's most usually a glioblastoma, grade 4. 
So these have the worst prognosis. And then if you have an IDH mutant, and depending on the loss or gain, uh, sorry, loss of ATRX and a co-deletion or non-co-deletion of 1P19Q, there are some classifications into different grades of oligos and astros. And uh, also depending on uh, the homozygous loss of CDKN2A and the EGFR amplification and chromosome 7 gain and 10 loss are also significant in this. Now as you can see basically that there are a lot of molecular features here that help in classification. And this classification is important because uh, oligos for instance have a good prognosis while these have like the worst prognosis. And sometimes there are misclassifications even amongst these. So what we want to, uh, the tissue biopsy and uh, our experiments is to accurately reflect some of these which will help in staging as well as in treatment for these patients who will be diagnosed with these uh, tumors. So uh, our workhorse is uh, basically whole exome sequencing. So this is just a snapshot of a slide of about f f data from about 40 samples of whole exome sequencing. Uh, that is the DNA was isolated and the exomes were sequenced and to find the most common mutations among these. So uh, the, all of these are data from Indian patients and uh, as you can see some of the, uh, you know, we got all the known suspects which is basically IDH1 which is important for this group of tumors and P53, P10, ATRX and so on. This is just a slide to show that we did succeed in identifying several of the known targets So we did this using the GATK open source, uh, um, um, you know, pipeline for SNV calling or short um, nucleo single nucleotide variant calling uh, available from the Broad Institute. So we also use the Illumina platform called as Dragon. Many of you perhaps have used it for other sorts of experiments as well. And uh, compared it with uh, GATK and its mutation called a Mutec2. And we find that we can pick up these same genes. And we did this with greater number of numbers of tumors. And we can find, uh, we find uh, similar patterns of uh, mutated genes that we get. Now, uh, what we also found are, are interesting interactions or co-occurrence or, uh, um, you know, exclusive, mutual exclusivity between tumors, between both of these. For instance, I, uh, if you recall, recall I mentioned that uh, in the previous slide, uh, that ATRX, for example, uh, is retained in one set and then it's sort of lost in this IDH mutant. So IDH mutant uh, and um, ATRX. So we find this kind of uh, co-occurrences and mutual exclusivity. For example, if you look at ATRX and IDH1, you find a co-occurrence here, meaning that these probably correspond to astrocytomas here. And so they have a high probability of co-occurring. So green means they co-occur. So we could find groups of genes that of, whose mutations tended to go together and uh, things that were mutually exclusive with each other as well uh, from this data. So um, uh, then what we did was uh, to use information on this whole exome sequencing uh, from about 2000, um, almost close to 3000 genes and derived something called gene mutation scores from these. So these actually reflect if a gene has a higher mutation score, then it's probably a, high, a very important gene for that uh, group of tumors, for instance. So um, we did some clustering on these uh, using you know, more newer techniques of clustering such as spectral clustering and then what we basically showed here this is shows the clustering of samples based on the algorithm so um, I'll just take a little bit of time to sort of explain this slide so the shapes represent the tumor types so uh, a circle represents GBM while the square squares represent astros and uh, the uh, you know uh, the cross represents the oligos and you can see that they've kind of separated but there are like uh, you can see that uh, there are some some oligos here in this set and there are some astros here and there's some misclassification so our algorithm does not classify them entirely uh, in the right way but uh, nevertheless based on this is based on pathological classification again which could have inaccuracies as well so we are trying to improve this classification so uh, this is done by uh, without human intervention and we also did this using uh, TCGA data. Um, so this is uh, data for several hundred tumors from the cancer genome atlas. You can see similar values of efficiency with which these tumors are basically classified. 
And uh, so one of the reasons why this classification is you know, close to 70% or not 90 or more is because we don't have CNV data in there. If you recall, I told that EGFR and uh, chromosome 10 and uh, certain other regions of the chromosome are also important uh, for uh, diagnosis. And this is sort of CNV data from some samples showing clear EGFR. EGFR is chromosome 7. So there's an amplification of EGFR, loss of chromosome 10 and uh, other things by which we make a molecular diagnosis. Um, so I'll just go to uh, an, uh, sort of an important uh, s uh, slide here, uh, which uh, wherein uh, the pathological diagnosis was not possible, but using SNV and CNV analysis, we basically were able to clearly identify that it was an oligodendroglioma based on the SNV status, as well as the 1P19Q codeletion, which classifies it as an oligodendroma. So uh, basically our, uh, our efforts are on to develop AI ML based systems that help in classification of uh, brain tumors and, uh, subs and, um, and, and so that you can tag some for human intervention but can classify most by themselves. And so this is what our efforts are and I thank you for your attention. I hope I will take you. We'd like to take questions. So why didn't you consider any methylome or uh, transcriptome signatures? Yeah, so uh, we have done, I have not presented the data, but we are looking at things that are diagnostically relevant. So the methylation pattern is very relevant, mainly for pediatric tumors. And so that's not some, not for adult diffuse gliomas. So a lot of this has to do with what is relevant clinically. And so the idea is uh, the current mode of diagnosis in the clinic is through, is mostly just pathology. Uh, but in some cases, fish, and um, um, uh, immunohistochemistry is done. Together it works out to about 40,000 rupees for the patient. So the idea is that uh, whatever alternative test you may offer, which also gives better information, should be within that range. Otherwise, it will not be something that a, that a hospital would recommend uh, to a patient. So, um, and also it should be, be in accordance with the best kind of diagnosis you can give even the information. So, um, uh, so methylome is relevant, yes, but for um, pediatric tumors and we haven't looked into that yet but that's something we are going to go and do as well. So how much time does it take once you receive the sample? So that depends on computer, you can do it in two days, uh, the whole process can be completed in two days given enough uh, power, uh, computational power. The experiment for generating the data takes longer and the logistics takes longer basically from the clinic to the laboratory and so we have a, a wonderful clinic uh, logistics uh, team headed by Vikas Pawar, who is our uh, uh, chief operating officer. So he is involved uh, in getting the samples as uh, quickly as possible into conditions where all the nucleic acids are preserved because it's very important. So yes, time is of big concern and uh, our ideal would be something like four to five days, I think, to getting the results. Yeah. I had a question. So since you transitioned from the research, academic research to finding your own company and starting yeah, it, yeah. so what was the biggest challenge you faced during that transition? So um, uh, starting a, uh, an, um, um, an LLP is a lot easier than a company as any uh, person would tell you. It's easier to close it down because there's a lot of problems in later closing down a company. So an LLP is easier. I would advise everyone uh, to explore that option first. Um, it's uh, probably a little bit harder than so, sort of ex you know applying for a US visa perhaps, that's all. So there are a lot of things that have been streamlined. It's a lot easier to start an LLP but the things that you miss most is the academic environment that you sort of get used to and that is uh, not uh, perhaps available to you if uh, you know unless you're part of an academic institution and so on so and especially at the start when your growth is really small um, then it becomes um, uh, you sort of can feel isolated at times and uh, but then if you stick to it and if you stay long enough you attract bigger partners which is what happened to us so we started with a small services company that we continue to run and 
and uh, we were um, and uh, another company exigen got interested in us and then uh, we sort of do work for them as well as us right now but we have a constant problem now to focus on as well while we look at other things and uh, that allows us to have a sort of an environment where other people um, we uh, the good thing is we interact with people who are um, working in machine learning and people outside the biology realm and so that is also very uh, but yeah I, what I miss the most is like an academic environment and the kind of talks on uh, different kinds of organisms and stuff like that you know like you guys had in the morning a nice series of talks which is very interesting for all the topics to be uh, very eclectic and nice and uh, so you know that kind of thing you really miss so I would put that for me as a as something that I miss yeah hi yeah nice talk so my question is regarding that you are looking at the genetic aspects of like the genetic cause for these kind of brain tumors but how like how much percentage of the brain tumors are really caused by genetic like no, no, these are not genetic, uh, these are somatic. So I'm sorry if I, uh, if I forgot to uh, mention. So we are not looking at inherited, any group of inherited uh, uh, tumors. We are looking at all the mutations that we are calling as somatic. So, you know, they are not uh, inherited. So they are changes, but only in the tumor. So the control is actually the blood. The blood uh, of the person is normal, meaning the genetic component is normal. So we are calling somatic variations, not uh, germline variations. Okay. I so hope I, I'm sorry yeah. if I didn't make that distinction. Okay. I sort of so and do you see a specific kind of pattern that in the brain tumors that you see these kind of mutations which are prevalent? Yes, yes. So that's what we talked about. So that is known. So, uh, uh, you know, what I've talked about today, we found unusual different ones. I haven't spoken about any of those, but I've, I've basically focused just on uh, the solid biopsy test that we are trying to develop, which is based on known changes. But it's a question of detecting them and uh, making them available to patients in India. That is a challenge. Right now in the clinic, it's not available. Yeah. Just go on, just, just, uh, I can probably hear you. Yeah, uh, so it was a great talk and I was just curious that uh, the, so the uh, mutations that, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that the WHO classifications that you mentioned, they are based on the uh, tier 1, tier 2 classification that you've shown there okay. and you're planning to construct your ML models or decision trees based on these sort of classification yeah data from those uh, so we derive data from whole exomes um, you know we uh, call mutations from SNV and CNV okay. and then that contains the information which is required to make that classification and we see how um, and then we train based on this so we are getting not just that information we have a lot of other because we are sequencing the entire exome we have a lot of other information so we are trying to guide it Keeping in mind this model, we may find new things, but that's what we're trying to do. So, uh, yeah. And how would this work for mosaic cases as well? Yeah, so um, um, so our idea is not to correctly classify every possible uh, sample that you get, mm -hmm. but what you believe is, um, uh, what you what we think is possible about 90% of the cases will be should be classifiable without the presence of a human eye perhaps and then the the program itself would tag some cases as being difficult as being mosaic where they have features of more than one which happens and then they are taken to the uh, you know calling by a pathologist or a higher level where an additional person actually looks at the data and makes the call really so um, yeah so we are just aiding in 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 the uh, in the diagnosis i just have one more question so this is more generic i should say um, so there are a lot of companies out there uh, diagnostic companies clinical diagnostics is one of the hot topics and hot companies right now so what in your experience uh, post the transition what kind of i mean entering into this kind of environment what did you think were the challenges you faced and the kind of standout points getting into this kind of thing? So, um, so one thing is to establish a rapport with the clinicians. They are central uh, to this and so if, if you have a lead of a clinician who is invested in this and uh, who doesn't look down upon research, that's a big plus. So if you have someone who's understanding about that um, and that the time scale that it takes 
So, uh, you know, most often we are dealing with completely different entities. So that's a challenge. For people from biology who have training in biology like me, I cross this hurdle a little back. It's getting comfortable to use the terminal for a lot of things. That itself is a mental block for most of us who have a training in biology to look uh, to simply use a GUI and not a terminal. So that itself is a big challenge. So, you know, I crossed that hurdle before, but many of you probably have to cross that hurdle at some point. And and um, uh, and I think having to cro talk across, get your thing across to people from other disciplines is is the greatest challenge I feel I felt. Thank you. I have a clinicians approach you. That is the main uh, yeah, so in the, usually, challenge. Yeah, I found that, uh, so, you know, the other way so I've had like sort of in, I you know I've been at both ends of this but in this case the question has come from from the, uh, the clinician side so um, that has been helpful actually um, yeah yeah it's 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 uh, so Yes, so I think it's important uh, diagnostically at this point and uh, um, uh, several are beginning to realize the importance of molecular pathology in making a good diagnosis and so things are beginning to change uh, as we move along. One last question. Thanks for the talk, ma'am. Uh, you have shown us you have three uh, three thousand samples of the patients, and you have made it a repository. So, in any way, it can these repository in any way it can help clinicians to select any therapy more precise, any targeted therapy for different kind of tumors. Um, no. So this at the current moment, I mean, those are all idealistic goals. At the current moment, it is largely to provide a more accurate and sensitive diagnosis. Uh, which will guide therapy because, for example, uh, the prognosis for GBM is one and a half years, uh, uh, you know, of uh, you know um, uh, lifetime, you know, uh, risk mortality. It's only one and a half years for GBM, but for oligodendroglioma, it's almost ten years. So it makes a lot of difference to the patient to make an accurate diagnosis. Um, yeah. And so the, it's more towards making an accurate diagnosis that then guides treatment, but not directly into, the, uh, into some kind of a treatment uh, per se at, at this current moment. Thank you, Dr. Shubhashini, for inspiring talk. And we're truly grateful for you coming here today and sharing your work and research journey. Thank you very much.